Let his enemies be scattered, and let the righteous be glad. Yes, let them rejoice with gladness, God has dried up my enemy. Let God And let the righteous be glad. Yes, let them rejoice with gladness. God is drying up my enemy. Let God arise. Let God arise. Let God Let 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom. Marcia Austin, how are you online for opening prayer? Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Praise God. Praise God. Let God arise. Hallelujah. Amen. All his enemies yes. be scattered. Yes. Hallelujah. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We rejoice in your presence. We rejoice in you, Father God. Oh, holy, almighty God. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this Shabbat, Father God. Thank you, God, for fighting for us, oh God. You alone are our strength and our great reward, our shield, our buckler, our all in all. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for protecting us, for keeping us, Father God. Thank you for leading us, Father God, by the way. Father, we thank you, Father God, for our pastor Israel as she brings your word to us, oh God. Father God, we are so grateful to hear from you, to stop together, oh God, to be one in unity, Father God, under you, O Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for healing us. Yeah, we need to be healed, for watching out for us, oh God. Father, we thank you for this loving, for your loving kindness, for this day as you give us, Father God, this day to go forth, Father God, and to do the things you have called us to do, Father God. We ask, Father God, if any of us that may need a touch or healing from your God, that you will heal us, and we know, Father God, as we believe in our hearts that it is done, Father. Father, we praise you. We give honor and glory to you, Father, for you alone are our God, our Elohim, our Father, our everything. You are all that we need and all that we want and all that we desire. Father God, thank you for this life that you have given us, Father God, a life full of purpose, Father God, and I pray, oh God, that you continually lead us where we need to be, Father God, and you continually bless us in your way, Father God. I give praise and honor to you this day in the name of Yeshua. Amen. While we're waiting, if we could just keep Katrina in prayer. I just got a uh, text that her first cousin just passed. Okay, so please keep uh, Katrina and her family in prayer. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Ooh. With my weapons, you will destroy strongholds. <clears throat> you are mighty warriors you are living on the earth but you do not fight your battles with the weapons of this world instead you use my power which can destroy any fortresses of evil you have been trained for war and equipped with my weapons so that you can destroy the evil imaginations of this world and every bit of worldly knowledge that would keep people from obeying me in my strength you will break through all the enemy's walls and reduce his strongholds to ruins you will turn back his sword and put an end to his splendor and cast his throne to the ground. Yes. Cut off the nations and demolish their strongholds. Yes. Their streets will be left deserted and no one will pass through the land. <clears throat> Deliver us from our strong enemy, 
from them that are too strong for us. We are your battle axe and weapon of war. We are your anointed, and you give us great deliverance. We are your end-time warriors. Use us as your weapon against the enemy. Amen. Amen. I will destroy you from your enemies. I will show myself faithful to the faithful and blameless to the blameless. I will save the humble, but bring low those whose eyes are haughty. I will keep your lamp burning and turn your darkness into light. With my help, you can advance against the troop and scale the wall of your enemy. I am the God who arms you with strength and keeps your way secure. I make your feet the feet of a deer and will provide a broad path for your feet. You will pursue your enemies and overtake them. You will crush them under your feet and they will not be able to rise. I am the God who avenges you and subdues nations under your feet. The Lord lives. Praise be our rock. Exalted be God, our Savior. He is the God who avenges us, who subdues nations under our feet. He has exalted us above our foes and rescued us from violent men. He gives his king great victories and shows his unfailing love to his anointed. Amen. 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 Um, I'll read okay. for Katrina. Now, uh, uh, I have that um, we do not look at remember we do not look at the prayer okay ahead of time and uh, Brad unpacked my uh, bags and my uh, notebooks okay I usually use uh, just the one notebook but he said you know whatever notebooks you don't weigh and my mind is saying hmm Brad unpacked that notebook I better look in it and see <laughs> okay <laughs> what God wants me to say well, what's in it for, for us today? Okay, Lord. So, you know, the, uh, one, one I put away, I know that was from last year. So I wasn't feeling impressed about that one, but this uh, particular one right here is from 2012. Okay. So of course I'm going to go to, uh, uh, March of, uh, 2012. And I think this was from March 3rd. I'm not sure. I think it was March 3rd. Let me look. Uh, yeah, I think March 3rd, March 2nd, March 3rd. Yeah, must be March 2nd on this one. And you heard what she said about uh, um, destroying the enemies. Jack them up. <laughs> Tell my people, prosper them. It is not a curse. They have not confronted the enemy's tactics or destroyed the enemy's forces. Every time I prosper them, the enemy comes to steal. You must be wise to his strategies and not just close the door, but destroy his forces. A closed door he does not mind because it places a barrier between you and him that you cannot see him besieging you. By the time you are opening the door, you do not see him, but he has left ambushments for those who would help you. Um... Let me see. Laid uh, spiritual minefields. Every time they approach you, they blow up. Not aware it is not you, but their lack of training of how to detect things around you. So, you know, too many of us, I think, are still running from the enemy. You know, every time something comes up, oh, it's the devil, it's the devil, it's the devil. And it's like, you know, I have to ask people, God, how come the devil? so much access to us you understand what i'm saying that's that's a problem it's starting to be you know really a problem it comes a time when you have to make a point that you know the enemy or god will arouse the enemy all right to come after you just like pharaoh but if i read this book correctly what happened to pharaoh jaya jacked him up devil than we are of God, which means we fear that the devil has more power over us than God does. You understand what I'm saying? And that's part of the problem because the enemy then has to become so big, okay, and you have to be so fearful that you've got to really start calling out on God because then it is only at that point you will see that God is bigger than your enemy. It's like, if you have a lion chasing you, you aren't going to look down and say, aunt, help me. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> you aren't. Okay. That doesn't make sense. 
All right. But if there's an ant coming after you and there's a lion, you call on the lion to help you with the ant because you you know that that lion could just crush that ant. All right. So we have to get to the point where our so big that we know there is nothing that can't be accomplished with him and through him. You know, that was one of the themes uh, for today. I'm going to have some testimonials. Uh, we had an awesome, oh, today was awesome. The Holy Spirit was, I mean, I mean, it was just awesome today. All right. And so uh, anyway, I want to continue with what today's program is. I'm going to read Katrina, Katrina's part. And as I said, uh, keep her in prayer. Uh, Katrina was going to read the book from the book of Revelation, chapter 15, Revelation 15, and I see verses 5 through 8. Verse 5, and after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen, girded with golden girdles and one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God Elohim who liveth forever and ever and the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no man was able to enter into the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled one of the things with this the four beasts, always remember, these are the same beasts that are in the book of Ezekiel. Okay, also in book of Ezekiel. Praise Yah. All right. Oh, Grace, you are up next. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. I'll be reading 2 Corinthians 1 through 15. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain, in this behalf, that as I said, ye may be ready, less happy if they of Macedonia came with me and find you unprepared, that we say not ye should be ashamed in the same confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not covetousness. But this I say, he which sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purpose in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for Elohim loves a cheerful giver. And Elohim is, is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things, they abound to every good work. As it is written, he had dispersed abroad, he had given to the poor, his righteousness remains forever. Now he that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed. Excuse me, there's a fly in front of me. <laughs> your seed, he wants the word too. <laughs> um, uh, food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness being enriched in everything to all bountifulness which caused, caused through a thanksgiving to Elohim for the administration of this service not only applies the want of the saints 
but is abundant also to many thanksgivings unto Elohim. Well, by the exper experiment of this minist ministration, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Messiah and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. And by their prayer for you, which long after you for the exceedingly grace of Elohim in you, thanks be unto Elohim for his unspeakable gift. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. In a moment, uh, verse number 10, go to verse number 10. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. He is actually quoting basically from Isaiah chapter 55. If you go to Isaiah chapter 55 and see, it's, it's so important that you cross reference these things a lot of times because we act like the New Testament is so new. There's nothing to reference it to. You know, but we don't understand that when Paul was writing this, the only way he taught them was from the Tanakh. Okay, he would have had the Tanakh, okay, with him. And so Isaiah chapter 55, let's start at um, verse number eight. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith Yahweh. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, I want you to think, think about the theme of what he is talking about here. These people have been giving. Okay, they're very free giving. And he's bragging about, you know, this particular ministry to other ministries and preparing them and saying, hey, we are coming to see you and letting you know ahead of time so that you can be prepared because of your reputation as givers, we want you to be prepared for everything and not to worry about it, okay? You don't have to worry because the same one, okay, that, you know, the same one that minister its seed, in other words, he's referring them back to what God said because he's letting them know you don't have to worry about your needs being taken care of, all right? Because the same one that gave you that seed that you're giving is capable of giving you more. Okay. And your faith always has to be in. So he goes on in verse number 10. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and we're back in Isaiah chapter 55, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may do what? Give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Paul is assuring them that as they give, just like God gives, okay, they will be able to get back. See. People get very selfish sometimes. They get very me focused that if I give this, I'm not going to have enough for me. You understand? Okay. But what God, what he's saying, if you're giving this to God, the same one that gave, okay, seed to the sower is going to be the same one to give bread to the eater. Okay. So as you sow, God is going to make sure you have abundance to eat. And see, that is the whole thing. In the church, we were always taught to give of our need. We were lacking, so we had to take from lack and give. You understand what I'm saying? But that's not the way it is in the word of God. When you look at our Torah, past Torah portions, beginning in Exodus chapter 25, he talks to them about giving an offering, okay? And everyone who has a willing heart. Now, the one thing to remember, God had already prepared them for that offering. They were offering the stuff they had gotten out of Egypt. Uh, you know what? I've never seen God ask you in the Bible for something he didn't already supply to you. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. The only time you gave really of your need was that sin offering. You understand what I'm saying? That sin offering. Because there was something you needed from God, and that was forgiveness or removal of guilt. There was guilt. Oh, 
Usually if there's guilt, there may be hidden sin behind that. So that guilt is simply a reminder that you need to confess. And what do you bring? A sin offering. You bring an offering for that to get expiation. But even with that, I see in the word of God where I don't care whether you were rich, the richest of the rich, or poorest of the poor. God gave you a way to be able to bring an offering to him. Okay? You know, and so there was no lack. You gave in the Bible out of the abundance that God had given you with full faith that the same God that put that allowed that seed I put in the ground to grow is going to be able to supply me. He gives seed to the sower. He gives seed to the sower and gives bread to the eater. And so he says, my word is exactly that. My word is wherever I plant my word, there is going to be a harvest. So if I tell you to give, trust me, your bounty is already coming up. You understand what I'm saying? If people understand that, if God gives you the unction to give and says for you to give, he already has that provision on its way. And too often, you know, when you do not give, you stop in your provision. It stopped. It's just like when you think about and you take your arm and move it, you are putting something motion. There is nothing in motion with your arm straight at the side. But once you start to put something in motion, it creates motion, not only ahead, but also behind. So when you are in the process of giving, you are putting something in motion for you to receive. You understand what I'm saying? OK, and that's what he is talking about here. You know, my word cannot return to me void. So if I tell you to give, it is because I. We talk about sowing into other people's lives. God is telling you that when you give, it's because I'm about to sow into your life. You understand what I'm saying? I am sowing in your life. We make it about us. Oh, I'm going to take this and I'm going to sow into yours. No. Okay. If God told you to give, it is not about me. Don't make your giving about me. God is, I am giving the opportunity because there's something I want to do in your life. And I need you to trust that if I give bread, okay, seed to the sower, I'm going to provide bread for the one who's going to eat it. Hallelujah. All right, enough. Okay, Renee, don't get me started. Okay, uh, Renee, you're next. Shabbat shalom, hallelujah. Shabbat shalom. First King, man, first King, uh, seven chapter, verses 13 through 26. From the Dekia Tanakh, King Solomon sent for Hiram and brought him down from here. He was the son of a widow of the tribe of Naphtali and his father had been a tyrant, a coppersmith. He was endowed with skill, ability, and talent for executing all work in bronze. He came to King Solomon and executed all his work. He cast two columns of bronze, one column of 18 cubits high, and measured 12 cubits in circumference. And similarly, the other column. He made two capitals cast in bronze to be set upon the two columns, the height of each of the two capitals being five cubits. Also, nets of meshwork with festoons of chain work for the capitals that were on top of the column, seven for each of the two capitals. He made the columns so that there were two rows of pomegranates encircling the top of one network, the capitals that were on the top of the pomegranate. And he did the same for the network on the second capital. The capitals on the columns of the portico were of lily design, four cubits high. So also the capitals upon the two columns extended above and next to the bulge that was beside the network. On your pomegranates in rows around the top of the second capital. Verse 21, he set up the columns at the portico of the great hall. He set up one column on the right and named it Yachim, or Jacob. He set up the other column on the left and named it Boaz. Upon the top of the column, there was a lily design. Thus, the work of the column was completed. Then he made the tank of cast metal. 
ten cubits across from brim to brim, completely round. It was five cubits high, and it measured 30 cubits in circumference. There were boards below the brim completely encircling it, ten to a cubit encircling the tank. The gourds were in two rows, cast in one piece with it. It stood upon 12 ox, three facing north, three facing west, three facing south, and three facing east, with the tank resting upon them. Their haunches were all turned inward, verse 26. It was a hand brick stick, and its brim was made like that of a cup, like the petals of a lily. Its capacity was 2,000 baths. Goodbye, Shalom. I want you to really look at that. We see that Hiram, okay, <laughs> he's the son of a single parent. Okay, first of all. Another thing, look at the dimensions of what he was working with. The temple of Solomon was considered one of the seven wonders of the world. This young man, the son of a single mother, okay, was responsible for that work. That was, understand something, okay. We did not have cranes. They didn't have cranes. They didn't have all of the stuff, bulldozers and things like that. So you really have to wrap your mind around how all of this is being built by these master out what we have today. Okay. And this is why when it looks, God endowed him with skill, ability, and talent for all of that work. He had to know exactly not only how to build it, but how to once again lift it up, develop something, a system to be able to lift that up so it would set down just right exactly how much brass to put in, exactly how thick it had to be in order to make all of that. With what? What were they using? We have lasers. We have, you know, all of this science when we want to build and everything. And all. Let me tell you, all they had was God. Come on. It's like, don't tell me what we can't do. Why don't we start saying what it is we don't want to do? You understand what I'm saying? Because when God induces you, you can do things that it take, would take a Superman, okay, to do with this. You need to take time and really look and try to imagine how huge those pillars were that he was working with. All right. And understand this was way before a time. I want you to even think about it because even back then, think of the pyramids and all of that. How did those people do it? With what type of intelligence that they had? Let me tell you what I have a problem with. Today, people are trying to convince you that pyramids that were done by aliens. Am I right? You hear that all the time. And the reason for that is that they don't want to believe that Africans could have done that. They don't want to believe that Africans could have done that. So it's easier to get your mind on some alien. It's like, really? Okay, some alien had to do it because the intelligence of how this was done blows the mind. But I also want you to think about it, how close, okay, even though it was far, it was a whole lot closer we were to Adam in the garden. The intelligence of man still, look at what they were eating. They didn't have pollution. They didn't have half the things that we did that are eating our brains from the inside out. And they had, and, and I want you to think about it, that still close, okay, closer to God. They still had that level of intelligence. And when God endued them, they were endowed with skill. That means God gave them a heavenly vision because remember, the tabernacle was built according to the plan that God had given Moses. And those that gave and those that worked on it, 
he allowed them to see a heavenly vision because everything on earth had to be done the way it was in heaven, the tabernacle being a temporary. Now, the plan for the temple, even though it's called Solomon's temple, remember the plan was given to him, to Solomon by David, who received the plan directly from God. So God, just like he endued Okay, Bethsael and Aholiab. He had to endue someone also to be able to and I'm seeing how that pillar is. I've been there to see this. Okay, to see how they could do this here on earth. Now, one thing I think we need to study the fact that he named them, named those two pillars, that is still sticking on my mind right now. So we may have to do a study to find out the significance of what those two names mean and why he named them as pillars. Because always remember, a pillar is something that holds something up. Okay, a pillar actually is, you can consider that almost like an intercessor. Why? Because it's holding something, it's on the ground, and holding something that is in the air and bringing balance, okay, to it. So we need to study that another time, okay? In the meantime, what, we have a video next? Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, oh, it just started playing by itself, okay? Oh, hallelujah, praise the God. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> All right, yeah, we have uh, Bill, I think, next. Oh, we want to get slow down, huh? Mm-hmm. I'll tell you what, um, Lena, why don't you do your reading and then we'll get see if we can get it up. He's doing the reading and we'll play it afterwards. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. I'll be reading. <clears throat> I'll be reading the portion summary and this week in Bible history. Portion summary: the twenty-second reading from the Torah and the second to last reading from the Book of e Exodus is called Vayehil, which means "and he assembled." The name comes from the first word of the first verse of the reading, which could be literally translated to read. And Moses assembled all the congregation of the sons of Israel, Exodus 35.1. This portion from the Torah describes how the assembly of Israel worked together to build the tabernacle. In most years, synagogues read by Kael together with the following portion, Pekutel. This week in Bible history. When the Holy Temple stood in Jerusalem, each Jew contributed an annual half shekel to the temple. The first of Adar marked the beginning of the collection of the she she Shekelikim. In memoration, the Torah reading to the Sabbath that falls on or before Adar 1 is supp supplemented with the verses Exodus 30, 11 through 16 that relate God's commandment to Moses regarding the first given of the half shekel. All right. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. Bill Cloud once again, and thank you for joining us today on On This Day, our daily devotional. Today's the 25th day. And it was on this day in the year 561 BC that King Nebuchadnezzar 
king of Babylon, and the conqueror of Jerusalem died. Years before, Nebuchadnezzar had been told by the prophet Daniel that he, and by extension, Babylon at large, presented in a vision or a dream by a head of gold. That's described for us in Daniel chapter 2. In the very next chapter, chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar commissioned the building of an image of solid gold, whereas the dream had been one of gold, silver, brass, and iron. This was an, uh, an image entirely of gold, which is to say, and this is what I believe, he had an image of himself made and raised up on the plain of Dur. And in fact, all of his subjects, administrators and governors, were commanded to come together and hearing the symphonies play, were to bow down and worship this image of the king of Babylon. Sound familiar? Well, it should, because in the book of Revelation, at the end of days, here's what we see happening. And he, that is the false prophet, deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many who would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So what we have in the book of Revelation is, more or less, a re of what occurred in Daniel chapter 3. You see, the beginning tells the story of the end. Going back to Daniel now, we also see in chapter 4, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, was given the heart of a beast and was reduced to eating grass like an ox, and get this, for a total of seven years. Yet we see that though this head of gold lost its kingdom's duration, he was eventually restored to his throne and to his power. And so here's the point of all this. If we believe that we're living in the last days, then we know that according to Revelation 17, there's going to arise a beast that John describes as being in the past. It was, but it wasn't during John's day. He said, because it's not at this time, and yet it's going to arise from the abyss and its kingdom is going to be restored for a 42 month period, three and a half years. And during this time, the false prophet is going to command that all should worship the image of this beast. And this beast, according to Revelation 13, has seven heads, one of which received a deadly wound with the edge of the sword, and that deadly wound was healed, meaning, or shall I say principality, that head was revived and thus the beast that had been in the abyss rose again. So when we try to determine what this beast is, to make it plain, to make it simple, all you gotta do is read Revelation chapter 17 and Revelation chapter 18. It's not very cryptic. You're gonna see a name that keeps popping up again and again, and it's not Rome, it's Babylon. Just Days ago on our devotion, I mentioned to you that I believe the adversary is an illusionist. He wants you looking at one hand because he doesn't want you to see what's in his other hand. And so then, considering our context today, is it possible that for centuries the adversary has seduced us into putting a lot of emphasis and focus on Rome and to focus on and watch for a revived Roman Empire? so that we wouldn't notice that he's reviving Babylon right under our noses. That is the empire that rises at the end. And so what is Babylon? Is it a geographical location? Yeah, it is, but I believe it's more than that. Babylon is about mixing and mingling, or to use today, today's jargon, coexistence, tolerance, social justice. Therefore, even though the adversary might want you to look at Rome, I'm going to suggest to you that you keep your eyes and ears open for what's happening right around us. Understand that Babylon is arising. Oh. Yep, that's it. Babylon is arising. That's all we need to hear. Mashiach and the Mishkan, Exodus 31, 
1 through 38, 20. 1 Kings 7, 40 through 50, and Hebrews 9, 1 through 11. The Parashah by Akiel, we learn about the construction of the Mishkan or the tabernacle in the wilderness. The verses of this Parashah describe in detail all the different types of building materials used in the method of assembly. This brings me to the point that I wish to discuss. Many people have asked if Yeshua, if is Yeshua the Messiah is mentioned or seen in the Tanakh or the Hebrew scripture. They ask because most Jewish people do not believe in Yeshua, and the one reason they give for their unbelief is that he's not mentioned, nor does he appear in the Tanakh. However, Yeshua is found throughout the Tanakh. In this Divine Torah, we're going to discover him in the construction of the Mishkan, specifically in the materials used to build it. God has used symbolism that cries out to us about the person and redemptive work of Mashiach, Messiah Yeshua. From creation, God has desired to fellowship with man. It has always been his purpose to dwell with us. The whole reason for him creating us was for him to live among us and for us to worship and glorify him. God needs and desires us just as we need and should desire him. However, man sinned and was separated from God. Since at that time, the physical part of man's being took precedence over the spiritual part. God was no longer able to walk freely among his people because of their sin. So a suitable, holy place was needed where God could commune with his people, where they could offer him atonement for their sin. The tabernacle was just that place. Exodus 38 and 9. He made the court for the south side, southward of the hanging of the court, with the fine twine linen, 100 cubits. Their pillars were 20, and the sockets were 20 of bronze, and the hooks of the pillows and the fillets were of silver. For the north side, 100 cubits, their pillars 20, and their sockets 20 of bronze, and the hooks and the pillars of fillets of, of silver. For the west side, were hanging of 50 cubits, their pillars 10, and their sockets 10, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver. For the east side, eastward 50 cubits, the hanging for one side were 15 cubits, the pillars 3, and their sockets 3, and so on for the other side. On this hand, that by the gate of the court was a hanging of 15 cubits, their pillars three and their sockets three. All the hangers around the court were of fine twine linen. The sockets of the pillars were bronze. The hooks of the pillars and their fillets were silver. And the overlaying of the capitals of silver. And all the pillars of the court were filleted with silver. God is holy. He can know what sin. White linen is a symbol of righteousness. By surrounding the tent of meetings where his presence was with a fist made of white linen, righteousness, God separated himself from sinful man with a barrier of righteousness. The pillars that supported the linen curtains were told, we told, were made of acacia wood. Acacia is a desert tree that is capable of flourishing in arid places. It is a thorny tree with a rough, gnarled bark, not very pretty to look at. However, acacia wood does not rot. It is incorruptible. Acacia wood is a symbol of Yeshua's humanity. Consider what Isaiah is in the description of the Mashiach says about him. Isaiah 53, 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He has no form nor commonness, and we shall see him. There is no beauty that we should desire him. The hooks which attach the curtains of white linen to the pillars of acacia wood were made of silver. Silver is a symbol of redemption. As you will recall from this week's parish show, Ketisha, a half shackle of silver was collected from Israel as a redemption tax. The socket sewn in the white linen curtains to which the silver were attached was made of bronze. Bronze is a symbol of the fulfillment of God's judgment as described in Numbers 21 9. Moses made a serpent of bronze and set it on a standard. And it happened that if the serpent had bitten any man, when he looked up to the serpent of bronze, he lived. Prior to Moses making the bronze serpent, people were dying from snake bites. However, upon looking at the bronze serpent, a symbol of the completion of God's judgment, they lived. As the bronze serpent was lifted up in the wilderness as a symbol of the fulfillment of God's judgment for the sin of evil speech against God and Moses, so too Yeshua lifted up on a pole in the fulfillment of the judgment of our sin. The combination of these three building materials, white linen, silver, and bronze, as used for the construction of the outer court of the tabernacle, have special significance. Through them, God was given us the, sh the gospel. Follow along with me this. Righteousness. The white linen is secured by Yeshua, the acacia wood pillows. Through his fulfillment of God's judgment, bronze, to provide a redemption, silver, from sin. Righteousness, the white linen, could not touch redemption, the silver hooks, without first having fulfillment of God's judgment, the bronze sockets. Do you see? Not everyone will, and that is okay. It's not because they're ignorant. 
is because God ordained it that way. Isaiah 6, 10. Make the heart fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hurt their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Mashiach and the Mashiach. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Be reading, who was a holy ad? The vice architect of the tabernacle. The first time we are introduced to a holy ad is during the building of the tabernacle. The Lord spoke to him saying, see, I have called by my name, Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have endued him with the spirit of God, with wisdom, with insight, with knowledge, and with talent for all manner of craftsmanship. And behold, with him I have placed Aholiab, the son of Ahismach, excuse me, of the tribe of Dan, and all the wise hearted into whose heart I have instilled wisdom, and that shall make everything I have commanded you. In Exodus 31, 1. The chief architect was Bezalel, and he was helped by many wise hearted people, but only one of his helpers gets special mention. Aholiab. The lords of the tribes, we meet Aholiab again in the portion of the Viaco. Moses said to the children of Israel, See, the Lord has called by my name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and his heart the ability to teach both him and Aholiab, the son of Ahimashat of the tribe of Dan, that's Exodus 35, 30 and 34. Rashi on the verse says the following, a holy act was of the tribe of Dan, of the lords of the tribes, of the sons of handmaidens, Bilhah and Zilpah. Dan was Zilpah's son, yet God compared him to a holy act, to Bezalel for the work of the tabernacle, and he, Bezalel, was of the greatest of the tribes of Judah to fulfill what is said, and the prince was not recognized before a poor man. What a beautiful thought. A representative of the highest of the tribes joined forces with a re representative of the lowest of the tribes to represent equally and companionship. Interestingly, when the first temple was built in Jerusalem by King Solomon, it was also built by a representative of the tribe of Dan. In the words of the Talmud, Rabbi Johanan said, from where, we do, from where do we know that a man should not change his occupation from the occupation of his ancestors? As it is said, and King Solomon sent and fetched Hiram out of Tyre. He was the son of a widow of the tribe of Naphtali, and his father was a man of Tyre, a worker in brass, in 1 Kings 7, 13-14. The master taught on his verse, although his father was from the tribe of Naphtali, his mother was of the tribe of Dan, of whom it is written. And behold, with him I have placed Aholiab, the son of Ashimach, of the tribe of Dan, Exodus 35 and 34. It stayed in the family as it should. What do we know about Aholiab himself? According to Ibn Ezra, Aholiab was equal to Bezazel in all areas of work and skill. The Malbim goes deeper into his role. There are times when godly inspiration comes to an individual for the sake of his own wisdom or for his own prophecy. Then there are times when the inspiration is in such abundance that the person is merely a vehicle through which the light passes on to others. In our case, Bezalel was so filled with inspiration that it overflowed to Aholiab, who was a ready and worthy recipient, and from him it flowed to all the others. Aholiab was the vessel through which the divine inspiration for building the tabernacles flowed forth to all the builders and craftsmen. Meaning of his name, the Kila Yakar offers an insight into the name. Aholiab can be split into two words, Ohel Ab, a tent for the father. It was he together with Bezalel who built an abode for our father in heaven here on earth. His father's name, Ahisamach, 
can be split into two words as well. Aki Samak, my brother is close. Referring to our relationship with God as the relationship between two brothers. Through the tabernacle, the divine presence and the Jewish people became close. Lessons. A holy Ab's message is one of empowerment. God gives each of us the opportunity and mission to build a home for him. We can become the beginning of our lineage. The holy Ab might not have come from the highest stock, but it was he who was vice architect of the tabernacle. And it was his descendants who took part in the building of Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. Our past truly doesn't define us. Shabbat Shalom. Key verse in that. Our past truly doesn't define us. Okay. Um, just one thing to note. When you are studying the word, you have a chance. Bring up the Blue Letter Bible. Okay. And you can, on the Blue Letter Bible, you can do the, hit the interlinear. And when you hit the interlinear, it breaks all of the words out for you so that you can either go to the Strong's, okay? You can see the Hebrew, but there's another feature they have there. They have this little bell or speaker that you can usually click. Okay, and so, so as you are, you know, uh, um, we struggle a lot of times, okay, with these words. You can actually go on there, okay, and that's how I learn, okay, and another reason for you to do that, because that's a good way for you to learn how to read Hebrew, okay, because you have the word right there, you have someone pronouncing the word, you have the spelling of the word right there, and so that's how I got to learn how to read Hebrew, okay, actually, so that when I, I see it, you know, uh, you know, you can remember how it is pronounced on there. And it is the same if you go into the New Testament with the Greek, okay, also. So this is a really, really good way for you, you know, like I say, when you get the a lesson, and I'm going to try to start getting the lesson to you ahead of time, okay, uh, just go in or even when you are studying, and you're struggling with something, just break the word out and listen to it. Begin to listen to it. And sometimes I will just keep clicking on it, keep clicking on it, because I'm spelling it out also. So that the next time I see those vowel pointings or whatever, I know how to pronounce that word. So you start doing that, it's going to start being easier for you to begin to read Hebrew. Okay, with that, it'll be very easy for you to, re uh, to read Hebrew. You know, so that's why we begin with the alphabet. That's the whole thing. Start with that alphabet. If you do not know those letters in the alphabet, it's going to be very hard. But once you learn those letters in the alphabet and you do something like this, your reading is going to pick up so quickly, okay, with Hebrew, because they have the vowel pointings there. And, and when they pronounce the word, you can see based upon that vowel how that word sounds. So the next time you see that vowel in a word, you already know how it sounds and you'll be reading in no time at all. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just I butchered some of those names, but I, I went this morning and, and did what you said through, through the pronunciation. Mm -hmm. And, and I had them down. I was going through it. I had them down. But when I got up here and did it, a little nervous. I, huh? I, 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 I tore them up. So y'all, y'all forgive me for that. Oh, no, no, you did. I, 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 no, you did it at the at the end. You were really, really rolling. Okay, with that. Sometimes it takes our motors a little while to get started. Okay, get started with that. But that's good that you you know that you did that. Okay, so you know that's a, another way. Like I said, learn how to read Hebrew. And just go through it really fast when you, you know, uh, are reading the Bible. Because some of these names are hard, they are very hard, you know. But also, too, just to give you a hint, when you see God break out those names, okay, like that, it would be it's a good opportunity for you to go through that genealogy yourself. There's a reason why Sam, son of or no son of such and such. And then you have one broken out this one, son of this one, son of this one, son of this one, son of this one. Why is God giving that level of detail? 
okay? Whenever you see God giving that level of detail, there's a reason for it. When you see him not giving a level of detail, there's a reason for it. So go in and study the names also. That's why that uh, uh, sheet that I gave you that not only tells you the letters, but what each letter stands for, okay? Break those names out into each and every letter. Now you're getting a hidden meaning behind. Like you have so many people that are looking for the hidden wisdom in the other books of the Bible and everything. You break these names out and these names will tell you a story, okay? That's why when you have the, the student version of the uh, JP Hebrew and the English right alongside of it, okay? You can go and look at those letters because every letter has a picture in it and every picture tells a story. If you ever want to get the fullness of what you're doing, okay? take a verse and break it out into its individual letters and individual story and you will get that meaning spiritual meaning behind what that word is actually okay saying we don't get that when we read in english a lot of times okay so anyway before we went to the uh correctional facility today and my god we had so many people there helping uh, uh, Mary uh, came from Dr. Latour too's. Okay, she came and uh, everybody was looking for you. Okay, everybody was looking for you. Okay, so uh, we have to put a, a, a reminder or whatsoever. Okay, on, on your clock. Oh my gosh. You know, uh, um, but yeah, they they look for they look for you. All the workers look for you, and the kids look for you. Okay, also okay with that. But we had. Uh, awesome the holy spirit was there today and i mean oh my goodness because uh the pastor that usually does the message wasn't there and so i wasn't really prepared to bring forth okay bring forth the message so that's always one of those okay okay lord this would be a good time <laughs> okay for the anointing for the holy spirit to kick in okay but one thing led to another led to another and actually i fully believe it started in the kitchen Okay, because the eggs, Ed, we had so many to use the same eggs. And it's like, I'm looking, are those eggs growing in the pan? Every time we take some out, there's still eggs there. Then we put them in a pile to take them out. And I look, there's still a ton of eggs there. Then we do it again. That's what is going on with the eggs today, you know? And it was just amazing. Even with the bacon, we started with three pieces for everyone. And there was still bacon that we had and sausage that we had and everything. Days when things like that happen, when something unusual like that happens, something is about to happen. And, and so anyway, uh, um, I'll give part of it. Then I want anyone who wants, who was there to give a, a testimony. When we got in, it was, uh, I have to say, amazing. I wanted uh, Jim to go forth to do the, uh, the invitation, okay? So to prepare the hearts and everything, you know, because trust me, we are not the only uh, uh, people that come in for those children. Tomorrow, they're going to get any type of church service that they want during the week. There are other people that come in, you know, also. What makes our special, I think, is the pancakes. That opens them up. Some people coming and cooking for them. It's different. All other meals are prepared for them by the staff. But to see people come in and cook for them, and kids love pancakes, okay? And the breakfast is good, okay? It is very good, you know? And so to do that, and then the services, not only the service afterward, but because there is such diversity, they see all tribes and tongues and people. I don't care, you know, what nationality you are in our group that comes to minister to them, they each have someone they can identify with, which is important to them. Because I'll never forget when I met Tom, okay, at Rotary, and uh, he finally asked, you know, if, uh, if we would come. He goes, you know, these kids are probably really sick and tired of hearing from a bunch of old white men. That's exactly how he put it. Okay, that's how he put it. He goes, you know, uh, uh, they probably would do really good if, if they saw someone that looked like them also. I wasn't offended, 
okay? I was not offended, okay, at that because I know that's so, okay, a lot of times. You know, it takes all difference and the whole thing is the Holy Spirit, okay, will lead you and guide you. And the one thing that is so important is that people today need to see people working together. You understand what I'm saying? In a country that is so divided along so many different lines, they need to be able to see that people can work, not just any people working together, but people who say they know God. If they, we say we know God, we're supposed to be working together because in, okay, the book of Revelation, we see all tribes, all tongues, all people, all together before the throne of God, praising God. So if you cannot get along down here, do not think you're going to have the opportunity to get along up there. Okay. Because on earth, okay, on earth as it is in heaven. All right. So, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, he gave the invitation and uh, a couple of uh, kids, you know, raised their hand. But you heard those that were there. There was one young man who says, he asked them, do you believe, uh, d does anybody here uh, believe in the devil or not believe in the devil? One young man raised his hand, okay, that he didn't believe in the devil. I didn't know who he was, but that stuff, it was just like, boop, blip in my mind, okay? And so anyway, uh, um, a couple of testimonials, which were great testimonials. The kids really related to that. And then Brad, you know, poured kerosene on himself and lit himself up. Because Brad was lit up, okay, today. Brad was lit, okay. He was lit today. You know, uh, really, really lit today. And I don't know if you want to say anything about the kids and the song. Yeah. Yeah, so it's just kind of awesome to see um, the work that God is doing in his young kids' lives. Um, you know, like you might, you might go there and plant a seed and it's good to see, you know, you're not what is growing seed. from the seeds that we've planted. Um, they're, they're keep coming to me with new songs. Oh, you know, I have a new song I want to sing. I say, Hey, sure. You know, so they're, they're coming up. And, um, what one thing that hit me is there's this young man there. He just wrapped his first song um his name was coleman and the crazy thing about it is he's partially blind he can hardly see but i, I mean you have to kind of help him out sometimes but he's blind and it's just kind of awesome to see that god can use anyone that has a willing heart anybody that has a heart for god who has a willing heart god can use you if you're blind if you st just stutter if you're this or that, I mean, uh, you know, so he, he got up there and he wrapped his whole, he had a whole song. And uh, so, yeah, that, that was just awesome to see. And uh, God is good. So, yeah, yeah, amen to that. You know, I mean, it was absolutely marvelous. The song that he was talking about. He said, I'm not worthy. And he just had his held up. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. And I mean, those songs were hitting the heart. Mary and I was sitting there with tears and everybody else sitting with tears. Okay. As you know, we looked at these young men who, you know, before the, and they admit it, they would never, when they walked in there, never, ever think that they would be up singing songs of God. I mean, it was like I'm watching them and I'm watching the kids and it was just like having a bunch of roses and watching those roses begin to unfold and give off that beautiful odor as these children just begin to unfold, okay, and support their friends and everything. And uh, it was just, uh, I mean, it was just an amazing experience. Ed, you have something to say. Yeah, good morning. It was... Um... It was just fantastic. Uh, Coleman, he kept singing, um, I'm not worthy. And somewhere in the song, he just talked about words of encouragement. And it just seems as if it just needed someone to come put their arms around it. It was, uh, it was fantastic. I had a wonderful time. One of the problems I had was pastor was asking me to say something. And I looked at him and said, well, how do you reach these kids? They've never been churched. Uh, 
Mr. Tom, uh, Mr. Jim asked him, you know, uh, talking about God as a father. Out of 30 years, only three people raised their hand that they had a father. So how do you relate Father God to someone who never had a father, who's never been church? And Brad started with the music. And one by one, you can see those kids starting to break out and break down. And after a while, it was just a move of God. And it was on and popping, man. It was ooh, it was fantastic. <laughs> You want to say anything? Hey, I, I didn't go in. All I did is wash the dishes. <laughs> Which is the most important thing, okay? Yeah. She had that kitchen shining afterwards, and it was a mess, okay, a mess when she came there. So everybody is always so grateful for, uh, you know, Lena. I know, I know the young man that was sent in to uh, clean, he looked and he goes, oh, Great. I don't have to clean this. You guys, it's, it's cleaner than I ever saw all week. He goes, uh huh. Well, our goal is always to leave that place better than when we found it. And that's when you go into a place, I don't care where it is, somebody's house, anything, always leave that place better than when you got there. Okay. And the uh, workers and everything, they come in and look after we get finished. OK, and the place is shining. OK, absolutely, you know, shining, you know, and everything. So, uh, um, you know, going going back to those uh, uh, young men. OK, when I had to get up and uh, speak different little things that the Lord was impressing upon me um, to bring up the three young men that had, you know, done the songs. And those songs were fabulous. I, oh, my gosh. Do you have them uh, recorded or anything? Is there any way? Okay, next time, is there any way we can sneak a recording or something to get them? A phone or, or, or uh, something? I started to. I really, really started to. But I didn't, I didn't know how to work the recording. So I would have been really caught, okay, at that point. You know, but they were absolutely awesome. And the word God gave to me for them was from Jeremiah chapter 1. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth from the womb, I ordained thee. And to let them know that they are special, that God has a purpose for them that is strictly defined by what he placed in them. And uh, uh, I'm watching them. And uh, at first that mother came out. Okay, the mother came out, you know, and you can't, you can't help it to have compassion for those children because even though they're sitting there all brave and looking as grown as they want to be they're still children okay and when uh, when he asked about a father and you see only you know two kids maybe two kids raise their hand let me tell you something it's about mother too a lot of them didn't have a lot of them were probably raised by an aunt or a grandmother or whatsoever and what broke my heart, what really broke my heart was when I said, you know, I feel like a, a mother, I saw one, one young man, he just, he just melted. He just melted. And I know that he didn't have a mother. Okay. We, how do we expect these children to be raised? Okay. Up serving whoever with no mother or father who raises them. And we want to accuse them of being weeds and being all of these things. And they didn't have anyone at home to leave them or to guide them. They get all their guidance maybe from school and that's no place. Everybody, you know, Christians have their panty in a, we a wedge about no prayer in school. What about prayer at home? OK, why do we depend upon the school to do what should be done at home? And if these kids have no mother or no father, who's raising them, Lena? Because with my grandparents, what it would feel like to have a father and a mother. I don't know when somebody says, who's your mother? Well, my grandmother was my mother, but your grandparents are your grandparents. You have to know what a father and mother do. So I don't know to this day. Oh, wow. You see, and so that leaves at least 
leaves a hole. Others try to fill that hole, but it leaves a hole because you know you came forth from, okay? And those kids just looking, you know, looking at them, not knowing, you know, a, a lot of them probably had very abusive relationships, okay, in the home, which is probably why in some cases they are where they are. You know, and we impress, and, and the one thing when we, uh, um, you know, impress upon the salvation message, you know, uh, giving your heart to God, you know, and all that, so that you, when you, basically when you die, are you going to go to heaven? And that's always the approach. You notice that was the approach. So that when, okay, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven? And I'm saying to myself, well, what about if you lived until two days from now? Okay. What about teaching kids how to live? Why do we, the church, prepare people to die? It's like after we leave, if all of you drop dead, you're going to heaven. Oh, wow, we really did something. Pat on the back. No, Torah is about teaching people how to live a life on earth. Okay, how to live before God on earth. And that's why it's so important in cases, you know, like with, with you guys, I press on you guys coming because when you see that those guys don't have a father, guess what? You become to them. You become as a father. And let me tell you, these kids look for consistency. They look for consistency. They don't open up to you all the time right away. But time after time, if they see you coming and you come back and you come back and you come back, then they open up to you. One young man came up to me. I'd been watching him for a couple of months. He came up to me and told me he had just lost his grandmother and he was so hurt. He was so hurt and he was so angry. And that's not the place to be when you are angry. You understand? Because you will take it out and next thing you know, you know, you're in uh, solitary or whatever it is that, that they do or they try to. They try to medicate the problems out of them. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. Because let me tell you something, the medicine that they give those kids acts like crack on the brain. After they leave those facilities, they do not have access to those medications. So what do they do? Get on opioids, get on all these other drugs. Okay, there's a reason for that. It's like, God, we've got to make a difference. Okay, and it is only the power of God, okay, that can do that. Only the power, it can feel through you, all right? And so as we were, as the Lord impressed, okay, on, you know, showing them that they are special, the Lord began to talk to me about the three that were up there. And I, I he always shows me everything in pictures, and I'm looking at them, and I see words, I'm seeing the words, okay, okay, that are in them. And I start telling them, I said, yeah, I know God is waking you up, okay? And you hear these words, okay, in your head, and you get up and walk, and he's just like beaming. Like, oh, wow, you know, how did she know that? And then the other uh, young man, you know, the one that was in the uh, front there, you, you know, the one that was in the front, uh huh. I said, you get very annoyed people talking to you because I know God is speaking to you and you want them to hurry up and shut up so you can go write your words down. And he was like, oh, yeah. And I said, you've got to learn how to control, okay, your anger, okay, uh, with that, that annoyance, okay, because sometimes people don't understand, okay, how to regulate the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit doesn't care where you are. He doesn't care that you are asleep. Okay, wake up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I've been writing down, okay, writing and driving at the same time. You know, he, do, he doesn't care, you know, uh, like that. So they need to be taught. That's why they need to be around people that are filled with the Holy Spirit who can lead them and guide them and speak to them, bring that shalom, teach them. Okay, that shalom, when to say shalom and all of those things. You know, we only have one day out of the month with those kids. 
So we really have to make sure that we have spoken to God, that we are prayed up to be able to minister to them, to give them something that they will last with them until the next time that we see again. You know, so the kids were just so awesome. They really were. And you could see them just really unfold. You could really see them unfold. Then the Lord impressed upon me to give that invitation again that Jim had done, which is why I did that. I know they were wondering why I did that. Okay. I did that again. And then Jim turned it over. And then he asked all those who had given their life to the Lord to come up so they could pray for them. The first time when he gave the uh, uh, invitation, the boy who didn't believe in the devil, the one guy, he did not raise his hand, okay? But at the end, okay, he came up after the second invitation because what I told him, I said, you don't believe in the devil, but the devil believes in you, okay? <laughs> he believes in you, that's why you're there, okay? And some of them, you, I mean, today you can literally see lights going off, you know? And I told them, I said, your life, without Christ, where we are right now, is this a dark place? Uh, you know, you feel a terrible place? And it's like, oh yeah. I said, well, without Christ, this is all the heaven you will ever experience. And that was like, oh my gosh. Even Jim and them, it's like, that's something. That, this is all of the heaven. This is the best it will get, okay, for you. And when you think that this, this is what heaven is going to be for me, I said, but with Christ in your heart, with you, okay, with God in your life, this is the only hell you will experience. You know, and it was like lights went off. And like we say, you've got to speak to them in a language that they can relate to. They don't relate to a lot of times the same old message that you know we've been using since the beginning of time, written on the walls in the caves. You know, <laughs> okay, they just don't relate to. That. You know, they relate to that music. They can get. They hear it. They feel it. And now God begins to put it into their language, and they begin to express it in the way that He made them, and it goes. And you see the kids just really now getting into it. And you see some of them, some of them are going to come up with songs too, because there are songs that are in them. Some of them are artists. They're going to create great things because now they fully understand that God has a purpose for them. He has talents he has bestowed upon them. But only they can because they realize that young man, I'm not worthy. And all of them singing that I'm not worthy heart i'm not worthy i didn't know he was blind i knew there was something you know uh, uh seeing impaired or something but to just hang his head and to be in a place where the song he got i'm not worthy but a word of encouragement i mean it would have. i mean you would have just we could have had t if we had had a bunch of pentecostals there forget it it would have been all over over you know but it was just just a wonderful time and a wonderful experience and that's what keeps you fueled up you know, just really keep you fueled up. And, and uh, when you're praying, okay, Lord, you know, help me with this one. I don't know their names, but Lord, you see them in my mind. Okay, so just pray for them, pray for this one, you know, and that one, and that their caretakers, you know, are, are you know, compassionate. And that is the word for today, the compassion. What the Lord impressed upon me is that you cannot minister in the power unless you have compassion for the ones you are ministering for. Because he looked at them and his compassion for them as a shepherd looking at sheep that don't have a shepherd, okay? Because a shepherd knows that sheep that don't have any protector are fair game for the enemy. They didn't have mother looking over them. They didn't have father looking over them. So when the wolves came in, the enemies came in, that's all that they had. We send our kids out to wolves and, and lions and all sorts of things when they go into these public schools. And we expect them to come out as model citizens when they have no backing at home. Okay, today, 
It sometimes is the only God that some of these kids will get because they don't have it. So yes, it is a responsibility because God said, Matthew 25, when I was in prison, you came to see me. When did he see you, Lord? Well, when you went to go see those kids, you were seeing me. You were doing it unto me, you know. So those who don't go or can't go, you know, put in your calendar on the first sab Sabbath or Saturday of the month to pray for us, please. Make that sometime. We are there. They usually get there from 7. We're there from 7 to 10, you know. And so put that on your calendar, okay, to pray for us, that there be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that God the eggs and sausage and bacon, okay, so that, and it is all kosher, guys, all right. We did. When we first started, Leroy, you didn't know that they had pork, this pork, bacon, pork, sausage, and all that. And we're there, you know, trying to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he used to cut two pairs of gloves, you know, gloves and tongs and everything else. And it's like, forget about the bathroom. Where's your shower? I need to mikvah. Okay, after this. And then I said, okay, God, well, the only way to change this is that we take over bringing the meat. Okay, and that's why we brought, started bringing the meat and everything, you know, because how are we going to teach them Torah and give them unclean things to eat? Because you know there is a correlation between what you put in your body and what you receive in your spirit. So if we're going to be there to give them clean spiritual things, we need to be putting clean, okay, things into their body, clean food into their body. Okay, with that. So uh, um, every Friday, it's like they wait for me now. Because they know I'm going to be pulling up between anywhere between five to eight. Pastor Israel is going to be pulling up with, with all the bacon and everything. You know, and we had a couple of people, new ones. Yeah, taller guys, some new guys, okay. And uh, some of them, once again, for the breakfast. Okay, one person told me, yeah, I purposely stayed over uh, for the <laughs> breakfast. And one guy, he only works weekends now. <laughs> okay, so he can get the breakfast. You know, but they come in for the breakfast, but they come in because they feel God too. They'll go in the room because they feel God. These people have needs also. Guys, there are people out there that need what it is that Yahweh has put within us. Okay, so enough of that. Now let's get to our lesson. All right. Exodus chapter 35. I might as well go ahead and shut you down. Okay, Exodus chapter 35. Very important chapter. And one of the reasons it's an important chapter, because what have we just come out of doing in our last chapter? Golden calf. Okay, if you went back to chapter 34, all right, uh, go to 34, verse 10, and I'm in the JPS to knock. Okay, in the JPS to knock, verse 10, he said, I hereby make a covenant before all your people. I will work such wonders as have not been wrought on all the earth or in any nation, and all the people who are with you shall see how awesome are Yahweh's deeds, which I will perform for you. This is after he was ready to nuke them. A couple of verses before, he was ready to nuke them, all right? As a matter of fact, you know, in order to avoid, and I think about this, in order to avoid nuking them, he gives them back to Moses. He says, Moses, your people. You, you notice that there's a reason for that. The reason he gives them back to Moses instead of claiming them for his own, because he's holy. If this is mine, there's only one way I can deal with this. You understand? So Moses, your people. Now, in giving them back to Moses, this is why we set up the tone for once again, redemption. You understand what I'm saying? Redemption. And Moses is what? The intercessor. All right. You need an intercessor. You don't want to be the one. I want to be so close to God that what? You hear yourself frying? 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> uh uh, you need an intercessor. You need people to stand in the gap. We all need each other. But they did this golden calf thing, and then Moses is interceding because God says, Look, I will fry them and I will raise up seed, okay, unto you. And Moses has to remind him, uh uh uh, you got to watch your name. People will say that you brought them out of Egypt but didn't have enough power to bring them in. Uh uh uh, not right, Lord. Then Moses asked him, Show me your glory. Okay. And what does he tell him? No, I can't show you my face. I'll show you under parts. Okay. <laughs> Which is what? His goodness and his mercy. His goodness and his mercy. Why not his face? Because his face is judgment. His face is judgment. Let me tell you, we do not look him in the face until he is born. Okay, we do not see him in his face. Okay, but we see him in his goodness and his mercy as he proclaims in uh, chapter 34, verse 5, Yahweh came down in a cloud. He stood with him, Moses, there and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. Yahweh passed before him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, and Elohim, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in kindness and faithfulness, extending kindness to the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he does not remit all punishment but visits the iniquity of the parents upon children and children's children upon the third and fourth generation. What did you learn from there? His goodness is abounding a thousand generations. That means forever. But the curse stops at the third or fourth generation. You understand? Third or fourth generation. All right. Verse 8, uh, Moses hastened to bow low to the ground in homage and said, If I have gained your favor, O Lord, that's Adonai, pray, let Adonai go in our midst, even though this is a stiff-necked people. Pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your own. What is he asking? Take us back for your own. But what is he saying to him? Um, I just heard what you said. You understand? So if this is who you are, then you said you forgive iniquity, forgive our iniquity. You said you would pardon, pardon us, take us back. Okay, now I want you to think about it. Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter 19, was standing there before the, what, hoopah, all right? And the thundering of the clouds and all of that, we get the Ten Commandments. And then he talks to us last week about what? The Sabbath. And how the Sabbath is what? The wedding band, the sign. Okay. When they did the golden calf, what is it they did the equivalent of? Taking off the ring, throwing it on the ground. I got me a new man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you on your honeymoon. He leaves for a minute and comes back. Oh my gosh. It sounds like a Jerry Springer moment. Okay. So what does he do after Moses intercedes, pardon our iniquity and our sin, take us back. He goes, I hereby make a covenant. What are we about to do? Renew our marriage vows again before all your people. I will work such wonders. He likes to show off and have not been wrought on all the earth or in any nation and all the people who are with you shall see how awesome are Yahweh's deeds, which I will perform for you. Mark well what I command you this day. I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. What is he doing? He's renewing the covenant that was actually made with who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay? Beware of making a covenant with the inhabitants of the land against which you are advancing, lest they be a snare in your midst. 
No, you must tear down their altars, smash their pillars, and cut down their sacred posts. For you must not worship any of the God, because I, Yahweh, whose name is impassioned, is an impassioned God. You must not make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, for they will lust after their gods and sacrifice to their gods and invite you, and you will eat of their sacrifices. And when you Okay, take wives from among their daughters for your sons. Their daughters will lust after their gods and will cause your sons to lust after their gods. Understand why? Okay, when they were in Babylon and they had married all those strange women that Yahweh said, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Okay, Ezra and Nehemiah went crazy about that. They had to do what? Divorce the women and their and leave them. Why? Because of what went on right here. Right. That's how, ladies, that's how influential we are. And where does that go all the way back to? The garden. It goes all the way back to the garden. All right? You shall not make molten gods, molten gods for yourself. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. So what is he doing? He's giving them once again, renewing the covenant. This is a snapshot of the covenant. All right. Then let's go all the way down. All right. To chapter 35. Then Moses convoked the whole Israelite community and said to them, these are the things that Yahweh has commanded you to do. On six days work may be done, but on the seventh day, you shall have a Sabbath of complete rest. Holy to Yahweh. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire throughout your settlements on the Sabbath day. So what does he say do? Remember, Sabbath is what? It is the wedding band. So what is he telling them to do? Put back on the ring. We are putting back on our ring again. I am taking you for my people. I'm putting the ring back on. You put the ring back on. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, with that. Now, okay, I want to read something that I have here. Okay. The tabernacle embodies the concept of, of the holiness of space. The Sabbath is the concept of holiness of time. So we're talking about they're building the tabernacle, which is creating the holy space to dwell with God in the secret of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the holiness of time to dwell in. Why do you think the enemy wanted to give you a bunch of other holidays? Because he understands about time. And God's Sabbaths are the holiness of time. It is a space in time. When you, oh my God, when you enter into his Sabbaths, you have entered into a minute of eternity because each Sabbath is a representative of what we will go through forever at when eternity begins. So he gives you that rehearsal once a week. Okay. The first time the idea of something being holy unto Yahweh relates to time. It is the Sabbath. Okay. Oh, we had holiness. Didn't we have, weren't we in holiness? In the Pentecostal church, come on, holiness in our skirts, holiness in our, in our hair, okay, holiness everywhere but the Sabbath, okay, that was the one thing we didn't, holiness in our food, any of that, we had a man-made holiness, don't get mad at me, a man-made holiness, look, I got my hater blockers, I will put them on right now, looking at you through the microphone, okay, all right, so holiness in time, the observance of Sabbath is a declaration of faith. Come on, the observance of Sabbath is a declaration of faith and affirmation that Israel is a holy nation as a result of the divine will and that our relationship with Yahweh is regulated by a covenant that the creator of the universe willingly entered into with us. That's law, okay? So the observance of the Sabbath is 
a declaration of faith. It is an affirmation, an affirmation that Israel is a holy nation. Why are we a holy nation? It is the result of the divine will of God. We're a holy nation as the result of the divine will of God and that our relationship with Yahweh is by a covenant that was made with us by the creator of the universe. Not just entered into by the creator of the universe, but willingly entered into with us. The creator of the universe willingly gave us a covenant, entered us into a covenant through the Sabbath, to declare that we are holy, holy people. That's one of the secrets of the Sabbath. See, I can't give you religion. You understand what I'm saying? If you look for religion, this is not the right place to be because you don't walk with God in religion. You, amen, amen. Okay, all right. You have to understand what God is saying. He's trying to bring, lift, I don't want to say lift you up, but create where you are an atmosphere where the power of God can dwell within our midst. You understand what I'm saying? With the church, you are tr always trying to be lifted up to God. No power here on earth. Why? Because you're in cloud nine somewhere. You understand what I'm saying? But if we understand Sabbath is what, when we enter into Sabbath, that brings the power of God dwelling in our midst, bringing the power of God down to dwell in our midst, which is when you have supernatural things happen. That's when you see hearts changing. That's when you see blind eyes open. You understand what I'm saying? Blind eyes open. That's when you see hardened hearts become soft and begin to be believers. The greatest testimony is a young man. I don't believe in the devil. Well, you don't believe in God either then. Okay? But for him to come up and make an affirmation with his mouth that he believes in Jesus Christ, something hit them today. And so that's why it's so important to understand the tabernacle represents a place where the presence of God can dwell within the midst of people. The tabernacle represents a place where the presence of God can dwell within the midst of the people. We are the temple. Is a tabernacle, temporary place, but the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells within us. The power of the Sabbath is that when we enter into the Sabbath, we enter into the fullness of the presence of the creator of the heavens and the earth and can draw on that power from earth into heaven. And that's where you see the most powerful manifestations of God and changing a life. And the first one he changes is us. We change a little bit every time we come together because wherever two or more are together in his name, he is in the midst of them. You understand? When we create that atmosphere, and some of it is created through understanding. Some of it, and when you understand, there is an expectation, okay? You don't come looking for, for God to show up here. When you are in the Sabbath, he is with you already. You are already into eternity when you enter in to the Sabbath with God, with that understanding. You come in with an expectation. How do we know they did that in the Bible? Because when they were sick and they knew Yeshua was in the house, what did they do? They brought the people to him. Paul's in town. Bring the people to them. 
because they knew God was going to be, the presence of God was going to be in that house. When you come on Sabbath, you come with your, I'll say your wish list, want list, whatever it is, because your expectation is that I am going to be in the presence of the creator of the heavens and the earth. And no, Pastor Israel don't have the answer, but the creator of the heaven and earth, if the answer isn't here, I will ask him who can create an answer for me. Come on. Come on. That's what this is all about. All right, all about. Let's continue reading. Okay, I'm going to let you out a little early. Verse 4, Moses said further to the whole community of Israelites. He's a whole community before. He talked to them about Sabbath. Now there's something else. I'm entering into a covenant with you. Here's the ring. We're going to put the ring on again. But here's where I have to know where your heart is. i got to know where your heart is right now. This is what Yahweh commanded. Take from among you gifts to Yahweh. Everyone whose heart so moves him shall bring them. Understand, y'all had just given to the golden calf, a God who could do you no good. That thing you had in your pocket that you used broke your relationship between us. Now I got to know whether your heart is back with me again. He didn't say bring it to the church. He didn't say bring it to the Mos to Moses. He said bring it to Yahweh if your heart is willing. Let me tell you something. I don't like pastors who coerce people to give, make people to give. Usually the only time I ask is what we're doing in Sierra Leone. If you got a little extra or whatever, okay, so that we can do what we have there. But as far as for this, this is between you and him. It really is. All right, whoever heart is willing, they shall bring them gifts for Yahweh. Gold, silver, and copper, blue, purple, crimson yarns, fine linen, goat's hair, tan, tanned ram skins, dolphin skins, acacia wood, oil for lighting, spices for the anointing oil, and for the aromatic incense. Wait a minute. Everything he asked for before, he asked for again. They gave with abundance before. Now this lets you know exactly how much they brought out of Egypt. Uh huh. He goes on, okay, like you said, okay, they start working and everything, and next thing you know, they have to tell him, tell them the people to stop. Let's go to uh, chapter thirty-six. Moses and verse two. Moses then called Betzael a holy hab, and every skilled person whom Yahweh had endowed with skill, everyone who excelled in ability to undertake the task and carry it out. Let me tell you something. If you say you're doing something for God or you're doing it in the name of God, it is supposed to be most excellent. Okay, this is why I say people say they are Christians and the work doesn't line up. Don't be using his name. Because if God has anointed you, you will excel in that. The secret of your success is who dwells within you. You understand what I'm saying? We are meant to be the head and not the tail. Okay, everywhere we go. All right. They took over from Moses all the gifts that the Israelites had brought to carry out the task connected with the service of the sanctuary. So what was the purpose of the gifts? To carry out what was needed in the sanctuary and everybody understood that but when these continued to bring free will offerings to him morning after morning after morning after morning all the artisans who were engaged in the task of the sanctuary came each from the task upon which he was engaged and said to moses the people are bringing more than is needed for the task entailed in the work that Yahweh has commanded to be done. Let me ask you something. You saw how glorious everything was. This was not a one-time offering. We saw this, okay, in the Torah portions before. We are seeing it now, and they're saying morning after morning. So this was going on for 
days the people were bringing, okay, this offering. Do you understand the magnitude of the wealth that they brought out of Egypt? Moses thereupon had this proclamation made throughout the camp. Let no man or woman make further effort towards gifts for the sanctuary. So the people stopped bringing. Their efforts had been more than enough for all the tasks to be done. So whatever is needed, that's why he says to me, whatever is needed is already in your hand and it's already in your house. Every work that needs to be done for Yahweh right now is within the ministry, whether you are here in Tampa, whether you are in North Carolina, whether you are in Georgia, whether you are in, okay, California, whether you are in Detroit, it's all in. You understand what I'm saying? God has bestowed each and every one listening to this, okay, skill that he intends to use for the task that he has given us to do. You see, I don't have to go look for outside. The only time I have to go look for outside is if there is disobedience and unwilling to bring forth that talent. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, and that's important to understand because God gives us first refusal. Those who did not give the first time were too willing to give to a golden calf. You understand what I'm saying? They were too willing to give to a golden calf and they died. Don't let your seeking of wealth and what you want to use it for be the death of you and your family. You know, don't you think those that died, their family around them say, hey, we're going to serve Yahweh. And then they're looking at what they are doing. See, we influence people. Influence our families, okay, that way. If we say we Christ, belong to him. There is no other. People watch what it is that we are doing. This giving gave them the ability, that elevation offering, to do what? Draw the presence of God down into their midst, and guess what? Down into their household. I want you to think about this. When we get to the book of Deuteronomy, okay, afterwards, what does Moses say? 40 years. Your feet didn't swell, your shoes didn't wear out, your clothes didn't wear out. It brought the natural, the supernatural down into the natural so that their things did not wear out. There was no feeble among you. So at 80 years old, okay, 80 years old, okay, Joshua and Caleb are getting ready to fight. <laughs> they eight years old getting ready to go to war. And what does Caleb say later on? I'm just as strong as when Yahweh, what, 40 years ago, gave me the command, give me my mountain. Which mountain? That one full of giants. <laughs> okay, 80-something year old man, not afraid to go up again. You understand the power of God and the power, that is the power of the Sabbath. When you walk into his Sabbath, understanding that you are in the presence of the creator of the heavens and the earth, it stops your time clock. You don't get older, okay? But it begins to reverse. We're becoming a new creation in Messiah. Coming in and understanding the Sabbath. That is why I say there is a reason why Yah brings each and every one of us through that door at a particular time to stop a clock, to begin to reverse something that was going on in our life, in our body, or whatsoever. Okay. I got in the elevator. I went to go see uh, uh, someone at the uh, hospital and got in the elevator with a, a woman, I thought this woman was at least 80 years old. Okay, at least 80 years old. And I'm in with another woman, she starts talking and goes, oh yeah, I'm getting ready to celebrate my 52nd birthday. I just kept looking at the door. <laughs> okay, 
I said to myself, you got to be kidding me. I thought she was at least 80 years old. And all I could say, that is the difference with Sabbath and coming into ah, Okay, and just think about it. I mean, when you look at Miriam dancing like a young girl. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and when I tell people, you know, go tell people, oh, yeah, all right, all right we have a dancer that's over years old. They look at me like I bumped my head. Okay, I'll show them the tape. That's her right there dancing. It's like, wow, you know. And so looking at some of the things, why did God wait? Why did God wait until we were 60 or 70 to start doing some of these things? You, do you realize that what that is what grieves me? that I gave the best of my strength, the best of my strength to the enemy. And now if I have that strength now, God, forgive me, give me that strength now that I can serve you. You understand what I'm saying? All right. And so God goes, okay. All right. But then we have to do what it is we say we're going to do for him. All right. We have some awesome things. I'm not going to keep you any longer with this. Let me just finish reading this. Okay. Man is made in the image of God, and he was given the earth to take dominion and subdue. Sabbath identifies all creation in the heaven and the earth with Yahweh, who is sovereign over space and time. So Sabbath identifies you with your creator. When, I, when you come into Sabbath, it is saying to the heavens and the earth that Yahweh, he is our creator. Yahweh creates man in his image, gives him dominion, and then, okay, a, a space or a place of rulership and rest with the Sabbath. All space and time are now reconciled around Adam who had been given power. It's what brings us back to the beginning again. You understand? Because when you come into Sabbath and rest with God, then when you leave sundown, day, second day, third day, you have the power of God. If you understand the secret of the Sabbath, okay, and the secret of how you walk with God, the first day of Adam, first full day of Adam was the Sabbath. And then everything, how did he have the power to go take dominion and subdue? Because God was walking with him. You understand that? Let that sink in. And trust me when I say heaven and earth recognizes his authority, okay? Heaven and earth will recognize your authority because Yahweh will walk with you and rest with you on the Sabbath. You enter into his rest, he walks with you during the week. And the heavens and the earth recognize that authority that is in you through him, the spirit dwelling in you, the presence of God dwelling with you, you're in the timing of God. You're in his holy place, in his holy space. And what I mean holy place, not this. This is four walls to keep the rain off of us. You understand what I'm saying? But his holy is that tent of time called Sabbath. All right. Everyone stand. Father God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, we bless your holy name. Father, we just thank you for all that you are revealing to us this day. 
We praise you and give you the glory for your, you are so worthy. Father, we thank you for the outpouring of your spirit over those children today. And Father, we ask that you continue to walk with them. You continue to talk to them. And when they pray to you, you answer them, oh, Heavenly Father. Lord, you be the father they never knew and a mother they never had, oh, Heavenly Father. Let them know that you love them, oh, Heavenly Father. Bring caretakers around them that will care for them as you do, oh, Heavenly Father. Minister to them. They are in a difficult place, oh Heavenly Father. So Father, let them rest in your hands and in your arms because we know you are the only one, oh Heavenly Father, that can help their situations. Father, we pray, oh Heavenly Father, for Katrina's family who has suffered a loss today. Father, may your shalom rule and reign in the hearts and the minds of that fam those family members and be a comforter to them, oh Heavenly Father. And Lord, those who are here, both present here in Tampa, those who are online, oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we are in your holy place of time, oh, Heavenly Father. And I'm asking you, oh, Heavenly Father, to hear their prayers and their desires, oh, Heavenly Father. These people have put things before you, oh, Heavenly Father. And Lord, I know as creator of the heavens and the earth, there is nothing too hard for you, oh, Heavenly Father. So, Lord, the answers to the questions that they have asked, oh, Heavenly Father, be with them, lead them, and guide them through your will and through your word, O oh Heavenly Father. Lord, if there are any that need healing in their bodies, O oh Heavenly Father, by your stripes they are healed, O oh Heavenly Father. If there are any, O oh Heavenly Father, in need of finances, O oh Heavenly Father, Lord, in the name of Yeshua, the word today says that you will supply all of their need through your riches and glory, O oh Heavenly Father. And Father, I just want to thank you for the great and mighty things you are doing. Father, we send a prayer over to Sierra Leone for shalom, O Heavenly Father, and great revival, O Heavenly Father. Lord, give us guidance on what it is you would have us to do over there and bring the provision. Father, we're having some difficulties in some areas, but Lord, I am believing that you will open the door and oh, oh Heavenly Father, for those areas that we are able over that we need, oh Heavenly Father. So Lord, we're placing all of this in your hand because you said, oh Lord, there would be great and mighty words. That, that was your word. That was your word to say the great and mighty things, oh Heavenly Father, that you were going to show your people so that they would know you dwell within their midst. So Father, I just thank you for it. I thank you for all that you are doing and the things you are about to do in your Amen and amen. All right, give God a hand clap. All right.